very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here in Korea. First visit. And especially as Kistet and Kais have always been my favorite, uh, favorites when it comes to science and technology and innovation. Thank you. I'll uh, never trust high technology.
And the basic lessons are we cannot replicate those who have gone before, over in history, empires, capital markets, you know, uh, at that particular time in history, division of labor. And if one country succeeds in, also another lesson learned is, if one country succeeds in innovation driven growth, others will follow, conditions of entry will be different. So we need a congruence of technological and social capabilities. So the countries must have a certain basic innate social capital before anything else can happen. And this applies to all latecomers. Schumpeter talks about creative destruction, innovation activities in firms, and firms as being the drivers of innovation. And Lodbar talks about learning as a source of technical growth. Romer is innovation, narrative externality and spillability to improve capacity for future innovation, etc., etc. But something uh, interesting has happened. Roderick, one very respected economist, recently came out with this article, uh, Unconditional Convergence in Manufacturing. It occurs in the modern parts of the economy. And robust tendency towards convergence in labor productivity, such manufacturing activities, regardless of geography, policies, part of the country level influence. He said this is the matter. The modern part of the manufacturing sector of the industry is such that many different players can jump into this and contribute and innovate and take it further. Uh, but just very quickly, we are living in this 21st century, the techno-economic information revolution, living it now. There's a transnational division of work and ownership, the 24-7 global economy, globalization, etc. Key growth levels we all talk about is excellence, human resources, strategic alliances for complementary resources, and also boundary services and industry changing very fast. And in order to be, for example, for 38 to 40 percent of that range is basically the service part of the cost of the automobile which you buy. So the services sector is getting bigger and broader, depending on technology, of course, able to contribute more, more productivity to ICT and so on. Then, what has happened in the emerging countries, the developing countries, are small and medium enterprises, enterprises emerging as global players, and uh, technological organizational changes, value demand for unskilled labor, even in developing countries is falling. Matching for transnational skills, as I said, and big cities, very urban areas, a self-sustaining economic units. They've got, as the economists say, three to four times higher productivity than if you're far away from them. There's a confluence, a confluence of resources, infrastructure, education skills, uh, connectivity, electronic, physical, all within say about 20, 30 kilometers, this clustering of these these infrastructures brings about higher productivity because it's the big, big cities. And of course, big data and security. 1970s to 90s, manufacturing can be done anywhere, not designing can be done anywhere. And this is the new paradigm. The designing part is as probably more important now than the manufacturing part. And this can be done anywhere. Demographics, lower fertility, one of the flip side of this, major gender imbalance, for example, in China and North India, ratio of male, this is one of the flip sides of modern size, male to female generation becoming pretty bad, and ultrasound. So, this is something we have to pay for. Be pay for. Now, how do we manage innovation and technology? The most literature on technology management relates to large enterprises. So, government organizations, economists and others, big companies have data, big companies are good communicators, and big companies show profits, big, uh, let's say, uh, annual uh, sheets and so on, economic numbers and so on. So, this is where they go for first, and so this is where they talk about And it was just also the dedicated resources, resources, asset management, and for achieving their productivity gains. But SMEs, which is the new game, new game. All the innovative companies, the high-tech companies, start off as micro, mini, or small enterprises. Now with them, their uh, information on them is very patchy, very informal. New technology enterprise startups are different. Their dynamics, their activity, their technology level, business process, early death problem, 
90% of them don't make it past the first year or so. Which sector? You can't choose. Should the government choose this? Public policy? Probably not. But the, what the government can do is uh, support and find young persons uh, shortcuts to join the global race for talent. Why immigrants are so important. The USA has this great thing and also the EU. It welcomes uh, skilled immigrants. But many of the developing countries don't. There's a need for this to happen. Uh, okay. If you want to become an entrepreneur, you must realize you're going to disrupt the ecosystem. From a system, a state without the venture to another with the venture, is it discontinuity? And people don't like discontinuities and disruptions of big spikes, big spikes in the professional structure. And you can create it all together in new industry. And normally this will involve in a linear fashion from stage to stage. Certain stages can be bypassed depending on the social environment. This is where the state comes in. And I give the reference to this very interesting article. It's worth reading. It's 10, 12 years ago, but still lays out a certain framework on how innovation may be managed. Now, the ICT sector is the most dynamic, but also the most difficult to characterize. But yet, in this century, we've got this fusion, this coming together of biotechnology, computers, quantum chemistry, biosciences, physics, simulation modeling, and all of this, coupled with new materials, microelectronics, is opening up a completely new best opportunities. But this is what's happening multidisciplinary research, and this is one area with the government. Governments and states should support, must support. Now, the smaller technology based firms are very flexible, and but you must to have them make them sustainable from the government point of view, you must view them as a complete system. Concept, except your product, finished product, market shape, organization, stage in the firm's life cycle and who the owners were, the people who started them. Generally, about half the new startups are not just fresh graduates out of a university. They are people already working medium to semi-large firms. They feel unhappy, they think they are not being heard. They move horizontally, start their own companies, and this is a, a new, new, a new, new high-tech startup takes place like this. Uh, so we, for the government, there is intense need for changing technology intelligence. Intelligence about how technology is changing. That is the best, the first thing, the biggest input that government can do to the industry sector, to the local sector, to the universities. Changing technology, good intelligence, trend mapping, trends, what's happening. This is the way to go. Uh, and a holistic and integrated approach, client profile, Large enterprise, they send me a cluster, standalone, new startup. But global supply chains and property rights, intellectual property rights, are going to be the barriers and constraints. We have to be aware of them. We don't want infringements. We want something which is sustainable. If something comes out, a process or a product. And we must also rethink university industrial issues. Uh, I think to differ with Dr. Atkinson. talks about the uh, economic returns from universities, I think that is unfair. Uh, Einstein got his Nobel Prize not for the general theory of relativity, but for, for the photoelectric effect. And we had the photoelectric effect becoming commercial 50, 60 years later when the technology was there was silicon uh, uh, started coming into the, into the market, silicon factors. There is also, but there's an unusual, unnatural race with university rankings. And I apologize to my Chinese friend, you've had three major programs and policies in the last 10, 15 years to increase the rankings of the Chinese universities. You're looking for utilitarian universities. And you're still not breaking into the ranks of the top 100 and top 500. Why? You have, science is disrupted. It grows and flourishes in an environment of irreverence. And linking it to economic enterprise only is unfair to the researcher and the teacher. So teaching is sometimes more important than being a researcher, to provide the right skills to the graduates coming out of the university. The reward system is very different. 
also for economics uh, as, as an output and for academics. Now, I, I would like to say we focus on SMEs and small businesses. It's not that they need funding that they lack that, but they lack practical experience in project implementation and delivery mechanisms. To give you an example, after the Second World War, Japan did not allow supermarkets for what, well, was it 1958 or something? And then the big stores came in. The purpose of the government was employment, lower level, small, they became productive and so on. Then the auto sector in Japan, all the whole supply chain, very productive, very you know, innovative, of course, forgetting the Tadaka example, the airbags and so on, but that's in, the flip side of when you look for profits and cut down on you know, uh, the value. So the key policy for SMEs is enhance technical skills and organizational capacity of the client. Training of financial business models, venture capital angel funds for high tech part, and if you can, if they're, if they're within the region as part of a cluster and part of supply chain, then a lot of innovations can take place and people can find their own niche and their own place. And uh, then you need innovation back. That's where the research in higher education institutes come in. Technology transfer agencies, KISTEP for example, doing foresight exercises, uh, uh, trend analysis, and so on, advising the government. Then the government being able to listen, that's very important. But nothing else, nothing will happen without that. And the funding for these things to happen. And monitoring the outcomes of policies which the government introduces and influences. What has happened? What is the follow up? Then vocational and training, technical training organizations, business associations, finance institutions, soft infrastructure, social capital. Now we have a major stress now, and I've been stressing in the last seven, eight years in Pakistan. Although I wear a different hat now, I was not supposed to for Pakistan only. It's that we have to increase, get out of this trap of low productivity, uh, low expectations trap, low skills. We give people different skills, higher skills. So focus on that, especially in the, in the high school level the last few years. The number of people enrolled in technical, certifiable technical skills, let's say in Australia or Germany or the UK is a 50 to 60 percent. There's very little in Pakistan, 7 percent now. Too little for those who leave school. And everybody wants to be a graduate. And now we have a, an unemployment level of over 20 percent. 1.8 million graduates coming out every year, 20 percent unemployed. Because they're not matched. The universities are slow to respond to market demands. Uh, change management, again, uh, strategic alliances with organizations inside and outside. This is where the country comes in. Technology transfer, mass making intelligence, and so on, foresight exercises, funding matters. And I, anyway, should the state pick the winners? Those who've gone before have done this. Costco in Korea, or industry in China, and Rare in Brazil. Orchid industry in Taiwan, and sometimes you can undervalue your currency. That's happening in China and it has advantages. But you must, the state must avoid doing everything at once and it should support those activities which have strong spillovers and forward backward activities. And this step may integrated in post China, regular retraining of the workforce, like for example Malaysia and Pakistan. So these are things which the state can do, should do. I must do. Then other orthodox policy, export subsidies, processing zones, special economic zones, domestic industry through credit, taxes and so on. Every country does it. And Trump also is talking about putting up the barriers for import from China and Asia and so on to protect local jobs. And the WTO world the uh, rules are out. If when your industry is threatened, you can put up barriers. So every country does it. This will happen all the time. That IP rights, contract enforcement, dispute resolution, is extremely important. And we, you know, and domestic rights, like Japan did that, domestic rights in China and Vietnam, all these are important activities. So to summarize the technology management and what the government can do, 
uh, finance, te technology loans, equity capital, development banks, other support, and technology, you know, uh, uh, st the st standards and the technical quality, R&D support, linkages, extension services, cluster effects, spillovers, competitive stimulus, infrastructure. If you don't have electric power, not enough, not, and it's not cheap enough, you can forget about being competitive. And uh, skills, formal education, technical vocational training, info training. And I mentioned formal thing because I hired, I used to, I retired as chief scientist in the Atomic Energy Commission of Pakistan. I hired people with PhDs from open universities in the UK and USA. I told them, I found there's something wrong, we couldn't communicate. And to, it turned out that computers were one area which you didn't need regular lab work. But even then, whatever they had to do, they did. They would ask you to do this in one month during a year. All the experimental work for a, for a month and getting a master's or a PhD. So my experience of online learning was pretty bad. People would, would work like that. Okay. So, uh, last few slides. Science is not neutral. Major social political impact, old new paradigms, responding to relations and building up. We don't look at the impact of our work. We don't Yes, we've got living longer, poverty reduction, but we forget World War II, Hiroshima, Vietnam, drones in Afghanistan, in the Middle East. And skepticism in the foundations of science, but the major moral impact, commercialism, financial rewards, and social responsibility. And, well, I'll just move very quickly through this. And the old question will remain. Socrates is asked this, can virtue be taught? So can innovation be taught? And who will be the watchdog of scientific ethics? And uh, let me give you a very quick glimpse of what's happening in Pakistan. Uh, agriculture, for example, the Green Revolution is essentially over, but we made some pretty good uh, you know, uh, expansion. Our population has grown by a factor of six. We fed our people most of the time. We export two million tons of grain every year. Well, so that's okay. All because of research coming out, and still a lot to be done. In terms of what the average is, what the best parks are in practice, and the best research, how we can do five major crops. Now we also set up national gene banks. Preserve our biodiversity. We're collecting wild rice, wild wheat, all kinds of things for future possible disasters. And I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of Monsanto. I don't like factory seeds, which you're going to do every three years. The old farming techniques, the farmer always gets some grain for next year's harvest, and this went on all the time. Some examples. There's a land lifter. Uh, the laser beam comes out, spins around, uh, hits a sensor at the back, the little board standing up, the scraper, hook it behind the tractor. 31-37% uh, less water, and because the uniform fertilizer intake is uniform, you get yield up 60 to 80 percent without changing anything. Came out of my labs. Then, of course, because we had lasers, we could build lasers, grow our own laser crystals. We, do, we build lasers for universities. We give them free in Pakistan. Just to spread the field, spread the area, and lasers for defense. And other things happen. Uh, let me just go here. Uh, we had major contributions to serve in kind. We didn't pay money. But we made, for example, the, the CMS feet, 28 tons magnet feet were made in Pakistan, and 40 laser systems for the detectors of the signal landing system, designed and built in Pakistan and fitted there. And here is another thing I think. Funding I've talked about. We have for our mobile phone companies, half percent of every call you make goes into a research fund. Half a percent. And it's now worth at about $500 billion plus. And it keeps replenishing itself. And what is happening is, look at the, the intelligent hospital. Now this is being tried, this all come to one institute. Small grants, $10,000 to $12,000 each, three, four years to use for the master's and the program. Through this you're encouraged an intelligent hospital. And now you can look at the family history, you can look at the genetic profile, and this becomes a part of the gene pool of the country or the, or the medical pool of the country. The first ECG machine, all the hardware software done here, 
then glaucoma detection using mobile phones, and this is another thing, uh, energy, where major things are something happening here, and this is another reason why innovation can happen. Those things came out of the Atomic Energy Commission. We built our own control rooms and our own big plants for the nuclear power reactors. If you had no embargoes and no sanctions, you would have kept long lazy, we are very lazy people. But we had the embargoes for 20, 25 years and we finished it. So, some more science in Pakistan. Uh, Astrolog Rock 1634. 50 stars, 120 location, table of the planets, cotangent, sines and cosines. Okay, 1634, made in a hall. But please remember, 1634, the Muslims use a lunar calendar. This one has a solar calendar, meant for export. And you don't find this in Pakistan, you find this in the Lowe Challenge Collection, US and Berlin Museum, Germany, in their museums, not available in Pakistan. But this was true entrepreneurship. I'll stop here. I always used to wonder what the origin of this sign was. Uh, Galileo raised his finger like this when he was uh, put before the Inquisition or the, the, the priests. And he, although he bowed his head in Greek, but he did raise his finger. hundred years after his death, his admirers stuck up, dug up his body, took out this finger, it's, a, it's in a bowl, Florence Science Museum. What, what is it? Let's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.